Hey there, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, I'd like to thank the Cruise Web for having us on here. Uh, my name is Hunter Swindle. I'm the Area Sales Director with Silver Sea Cruises. And joining me is Carl Kanstotter. He is our Director of Expedition Sales for the East Coast, US, Canada, and South America as well. So again, thanks for having us, the Cruise Web. Thanks for putting all this together. We're really looking forward to talking to you all today about uh, Silver Sea. So let's jump right into it. Um, so today we're gonna to focus mostly on the expedition side, but I wanted to give everybody an overall view of Silver Sea as a whole. Uh, so we operate two fleets, essentially. We have our classic fleet, which is your classic cruising, uh, what you typically think of as relaxing, nice, you know, relaxing cruise is what you're really looking for. So we, we offer that as well as the expedition side, which again, we will touch on today. Uh, that's a little bit more in depth and a lot more boots on the ground. So we'll get into that here in just a few. But um, this gives you an idea of what I'm talking about when I'm, when I'm thinking of classic cruising. So we, we go to all the quote normal destinations all around the world, Europe, Asia, Australia, wherever it may be, the Med. Uh, but we also do it in a very different way. Our ships and the size of our ships allow us to go to places like you see here under the Tower Bridge in London which very, very few cruise ships get to do, but we are able to do it with the size of our ship. So it's really, really impactful and really great for your guests. Um, so that's really it for classic. We're gonna go over to the um, expedition side, but before we do, I, I do wanna touch on one thing. Um, so this is a list of the awards that we as Silver Sea have received in the past few years. And I personally am not too big on awards. Um, a lot of them, you know, the popularity contest, they may not necessarily focus on what the award is for. It may be for something else, but it's, it's a nice look. But we did um, receive one last year at Virtuoso uh, Travel Week, and this is voted on by the travel advisors within Virtuoso. And we were awarded with the Virtuoso Best Expedition Cruise Line for 2019. And the reason that means so much to me and Carl and everybody else on our team is because we're not looked at as a true, and I put true in quotations, a true expedition line because we are too luxurious, they think. But today, Carl is gonna tell you all about how Silver Sea luxury goes well into the expedition market and, and what we're doing. So Carl, take it away. Thanks very much, Hunter. <clears throat> thanks again to the Cruise Web for having us and uh, thanks for watching this. So Hunter touched on how the the size of our vessels is one of the hallmarks of our brand and not just in terms of the guest capacity because obviously that's important our vessels range in guest capacity from 100 guests to 608 guests but the size of our vessels in terms of their physical size so 100 just showed an image sorry i'm just going to try and advance the slide there we go um the, that image of the silver wind sailing under the tower bridge of london that speaks volumes because the physical size of our vessels, the shallow draft allows us to do all sorts of things that you couldn't do with a great big mega cruise ship. So sailing into London is one of those things. Um, very often you'll see London on an itinerary, a cruise itinerary, and in brackets beside the word London, you'll see the word Dover or uh, um, Greenwich or Southampton or something like that, because that's truly where you're sailing out of. You might be flying into London, but you've got a bit of a, a drive to get to where the port is, to where the ship is. When we have London in an itinerary, we're able to say London because the ship is small enough to sail under the Tower Bridge and we go up the Thames and we arrive in downtown London. So it's that small size of ship that really allows us to do a lot of the things that we do, both on the classic side and on the expedition side. So this is uh, what we wanted to do was focus on expedition. And I thought we'd start here with what is expedition cruising? Everybody knows what cruising is, but what's expedition cruising? It's for some people, it's a new term. It's certainly not something new. It's It's been going on for decades. It's basically taking uh, an, a group of passengers on a small ship to a destination that's very, very difficult to get to on your own, if not impossible to do on your own, and and then exploring your surroundings when you get there. What's different with Silver Sea is the way that we do it. We use this ultra luxury small ship uh, as our platform 
to get to that remote destination. And then we get off of the ship and we go exploring. So what's expedition cruising? It's not this. These are not expedition cruise ships. These people are not on an expedition. And neither are these people. Now, I'm kind of poking fun at this stuff, but only in a, in a, in a bit of a way, because a lot of people, when they start cruising, they'll start on the royals and the carnivals and that sort of thing, because they're younger. They haven't got as much disposable income. They may not have as much time. They've got young kids with them, that sort of thing. And so people will start off on the contemporary lines. As you age and as you mature in your your uh, traveling career, if you will, and and in your your cruising, you might start to realize that hey, that many people on a ship is not for me. I want something a little bit smaller, something with fewer guests on board, um, and something that's going to different destinations. Uh, maybe still the Med, maybe still the Caribbean, but smaller ports where the big ships can't get into. I want to see something different um, that I may not have seen before, and then. Further on in their careers, again, a little bit older, a little more established, more more time, a little bit more disposable income. The kids have moved on, and that's where luxury comes in. And that's where expedition comes in as well, because people are looking for something new, something different. So with expedition, if you look at this map, this is from our 2019 sailing season. All of the white dots represent places, ports that we visited um, on our classic fleet. And all the red dots represent ports that we visited with the expedition fleet. So of the over 900 destinations in total, 570 of them were expedition. So well more than half. And again, it's because of the size of the vessels that allows us to get to these places. So you can see, for example, Alaska and the Russian Far East, um, the West Coast of Africa, the West Coast of South America, the Kimberley Coast, the Northwest part of Australia, all through Micronesia, Melanesia, Polynesia, uh, Papua New Guinea, over the top of Russia, over the top of Canada, um, a lot of destinations. In addition to Antarctica, the Arctic, and the Galapagos, which is which are the three main ones, or, or the ones that. Um, where we send them the greatest number of people, put it that way. So pretty much anywhere water touches land and a lot of these pretty far flung places, that's what we're doing with expedition. And again, using that small ship to get there. So the fleet is currently, the expedition fleet, excuse me, is currently made up of the Silver Explorer, the Silver Cloud and the Silver Galapagos. In July of 2020, the Silver Origin will replace the Silver Galapagos sailing exclusively in the Galapagos. So it's 365 days a year the Silver Origin will be sailing in the Galapagos. And then later in 2020, the Silver Wind is scheduled to be converted to an expedition ship as well. And that just means that she'll get um, a higher ice class. She'll get more steel in the hull so that she can go into the polar regions and, and push the ice aside. We'll put kayaks on her. We'll put Zodiacs on her. We'll actually reduce the guest capacity so that we can increase the expedition staff capacity. And everything that you would expect from an all-inclusive luxury cruise line on board, gratuities are all covered in your cruise fare. The free Wi-Fi that's covered in your cruise fare. Butler service. Uh, we include the international economy air. Everything is included, not just on the classic side, but also on the expedition side. So everything that's included in classic also translates over to expedition. In addition to the highly qualified expedition team, the Zodiac exploration. So all of the excursions are included. Uh, some of the gear where it's required, and we can go into that a little bit, and a, an exclusive partnership with the Royal Geographic Society. Um, the Silver Origin that will be sailing in the Galapagos, we have a partnership with the Royal Geographical Society and some of their artifacts about the Galapagos and some of Darwin's replicas of, of Darwin's sketches and notebooks and that sort of thing will be on display in that ship. So that partnership is really uh, important to us as well. So I mentioned that the big three destinations when we're talking about expedition are Antarctica, the Arctic, and Galapagos. So we'll do a, a little bit more in detail about those. I, th I think Hunter touched on this as well. Very often when you're considered a small ship luxury cruise line and you're also doing expedition, there might be this notion that you're doing expedition light how expedition is it? Well, we're going into our 12th season of expedition. And you can see here where these guests are coming ashore. 
the ship, again, not too far away because the draft is so shallow that we can get there very easily. The, the uh, trip from the ship via Zodiac to make this landing on South Georgia uh, is only about a three or four minute Zodiac ride. It's not 15 or 20 minutes. And this is full on expedition. We are dropping off these guests right in the middle of this penguin colony on this little island that's sort of halfway between the southern tip of South America and uh, the Antarctic Peninsula. So this is the real deal. It's not expedition light. This is for people that are looking for something very, very different and, and looking to have a, a wonderful uh, wildlife experience. Here we are landing at uh, the Antarctic continent. This is for many of these guests, probably the first time they've stepped foot on the seventh continent. You can see we're coming ashore there by Zodiac. We've got expedition team members in the water up to their knees or they're halfway up uh, uh, their thighs standing in the cold water to be able to assist the guests to get out of the Zodiacs and to get on to land um, without getting uh, without getting themselves wet. And this is where the gear comes in. All those red parkas that you see the guests wearing, whenever we're operating in the polar regions, so Antarctica, the Arctic, uh, but also when we're operating in the Russian Far East, in Alaska and in the Chilean fjords, that parka is complimentary. It's it's waiting for you in your suite when you arrive, and it's yours to keep. And then we give you a very, very comprehensive packing list of all the other gear that we think is required uh, for you to stay comfortable and stay dry and stay warm in a situation like this or anywhere for that matter. And we'll talk about that. Yeah, we, offer, we offer the packing list for all of our destinations all across the world. So if you're unfamiliar with the climates or what's going on there, we're happy to help. Yeah, and very destination specific. So, um, and again, for you know, this is a landing on the continent for people that are looking for something more active. If they want to take off and go and do a hike with some of the expedition team, of course, they can do that as well. While one half of the guests complement on board are on shore and and exploring the continent and looking at the, the penguin colonies, another half are off doing what we call zodiac cruising. So they're in the zodiacs, these rigid inflatable boats. The perspective is quite unique because now you're only about three feet off the water and you're seeing the continent from that perspective, very close to the waterline. Um, you're getting up close, closer to the icebergs, to the glaciers. You're getting much closer to the wildlife as well. And the sights and the sounds and the smells are all highlighted because you're that much closer to all of this. Um, kayaking, whenever we offer kayaking, it's complimentary. It's all included. Um, we've got eight tandem kayaks and then two solo kayaks. So we can get 16 guests with two kayak guides out at a time. And if you see the whale there that's just breached in the lower right-hand corner, and you see the direction that some of those kayaks are uh, moving in, they're about to have a pretty close encounter with a whale. So imagine that perspective. Now you're just a couple feet off the water, uh, self-propelled, you're away from the ship and having that incredible experience. So then the Arctic, uh, another one of the very, very popular destinations for us. And I mentioned I, the ice class of a ship, and I mentioned that the wind is scheduled to be converted to become an expedition ship. And one of the things that would go into that conversion is more steel in the hull in order to give her a higher ice class. The reason we need to do that is because in the Arctic, it's a bit of a safari where in contrast to Antarctica, where we know the penguin colonies, uh, we know where the penguins will be and we know where those colonies are because the penguins return to those colonies year after year. In the Arctic, it's, going on, it, it's like going on safari because the wildlife that we're hoping to see, the beluga or the narwhal or the walrus, the polar bears, uh, the musk oxen, the, uh, the, the, the reindeer, we don't know where they're gonna be. So we need to use the ship and in this case with a high ice class to push the ice aside and to penetrate deeper into these bays and these fjords and these inlets to find, uh, hopefully to see some of the wildlife and to get closer to everything. Something that uh, Expedition has in common regardless of the destination and, and that we request that you come with is a great sense of adventure. Um, we can't promise things like wildlife or atmospheric events like the Northern Lights, um, you'd be foolish to, to promise those things. But when they do happen, we promise that we're going to make the best of that opportunity and and uh, show you, you know, what we know about these things and, and educate you and, and uh, 
show off, if you will, some of these incredible parts of the world. So a, a phenomenon like this, or this happened around one o'clock in the morning. And, you know, there, there has to be an understanding that we're going to get on the PA and we're going to wake you up and we're going to tell you, hey, folks, there are northern lights happening right now. So put your your big red parkas on over top of your jammies and put your boots on and come up to the observation deck and come and see this, because this is why a lot of people have come to the Arctic. So, uh, again, that's where that sense of adventure uh, is, is very, very important. And then you're rewarded with things like this. Um, you know, speak to the folks at the cruise web who in turn can get in touch with us to find out the right time of year to go to a particular destination to look for whatever it is you're looking for. If you're looking for polar bears in the Arctic, there's a certain time of year to go and there's a certain part of the Arctic to go to. If you're looking for Northern Lights, there's a different part of the Arctic and a different uh, time of year that, you've, that you might want to consider. So again, talk to the folks at the cruise web and, and we can uh, make sure that you're going to the right place at the right time, given your interest but always with a great sense of adventure. So the same is true for wildlife. We just don't know where or when, or, or for that matter, if we're going to see the wildlife. We we certainly try to. Uh, we've got a, quite a good track record, but sometimes you may see the wildlife from a little bit closer and other times you may see it from further away. Uh, but we'll do what we can to get you uh, as close as possible without interfering or without interrupting uh, what they're up to. But we'll also stop what we're doing in order to take advantage of a situation with wildlife as well. So uh, a couple of years ago, we came across a beached whale with a couple of male, uh, juvenile male polar bears feasting on this. So there were a couple of things that were interesting about that. First of all, coming across a beached whale. Uh, secondly, finding bears. But two, uh, thir thirdly, the two juvenile males, they are very, very solitary and typically wouldn't be together. But when someone laid out this buffet for them and, and they were able to just go there and, and uh, help themselves to as much as they wanted, um, it, it made for an opportunity to see these two male bears side by side feasting. What was interesting too, is we were scheduled to visit a Greenlandic uh, Inuit community that day. And we didn't want to forgo the opportunity of, of showing the guests everything that was happening with these bears feasting. So we radioed to the, the community and just said, listen, we're still coming, but we're going to be a little bit late. And they completely understand. And uh, the guests still got the Inuit vi community visit in. But prior to that, we spent a good amount of time watching these bears feasting on this, this whale carcass. So again, always trying to take advantage of an opportunity, being able to pivot and change things uh, on the fly and knowing that our guests have a, a great sense of adventure when they join us. Like I said, sometimes you're rewarded with these amazing opportunities. The third of the big three is, is the Galapagos. And I jokingly say that this one is the gateway drug to expedition. It's very, very close. Uh, it's a three and a half hour flight from Miami to Quito and Quito is where we start off this voyage. It's uh, very often only an hour or two time difference from, from home, depending on where you're coming from in North America. Um, you will only experience an hour or two of time difference uh, between home and Ecuador. And in Ecuador, a lot of people speak English and their currency is pegged one-to-one -to, -one to the USD. So it, it's just an easy place to get around as a tourist. Uh, and the other thing about this voyage, so once we get over to the Galapagos, it's the most casual of, of anything. Hunter, you've sailed a fair bit with Silver Sea and, and I know you've been to the Galapagos. What would you say about the dress code on, in the Galapagos? It's, it's like a weekend pool party most of the time, to be honest. It's uh, <laughs> quite relaxed. Yeah, you're in shorts and sandals and t-shirts most of the time. I think the only uh, dress code guideline that we have or, or, or dress code that we have is that no jeans in the dining room uh, at dinner. So if you wanted to stay in your shorts and t-shirt and sandals and uh, have something at lunch at the pool grill or even dinner at the pool grill or at the grill uh, outside, you could certainly do that. You do not have to dress for dinner. And, and as I said, most of the time, uh, folks are dressed like this because you're a couple of degrees from the equator. Uh, so regardless of what time of year you go to the Galapagos, it's always quite temperate. You might want to put a jacket on in the evenings, but uh, it's it's always pretty temperate. It's one of those destinations that we've all heard about and we've all learned uh, about in school. And it's very much about 
uh, the exploration and, and Darwin and, and, you know, we've learned about the theory of evolution and that sort of thing, but also about the wildlife. It's a photographer's paradise. It's a nature lover's paradise. It's a wildlife lover's uh, paradise. And this is no exaggeration of how close you can get to the wildlife. This is a marine iguana uh, and a, a one of the species that you'll come across in abundance in the Galapagos. The same is true of the blue-footed boobies. They're everywhere. You don't have to go looking around for them. They're literally all over the place. So all of these sort of iconic species that you've heard about um, in, in relation to the Galapagos, you see them quite readily. Even the giant tortoises, there are two occasions on both of our itineraries. We offer, operate two different itineraries in the Galapagos. There are two occasions on each itinerary to see the, uh, the um, giant tortoises of the Galapagos. So all these iconic species are pretty easy to come across. It's an amazing destination for kids. Uh, this is my son, Alex, when we went to the Galapagos in July of 2018, and he was about five and a half. And as a parent, you know, you kind of wonder, are you making the right decision taking them to a place like this? But something about the Galapagos is that 97% of the Galapagos is undeveloped. So when you arrive at these these landing sites where, where, the, where the Zodiac takes you ashore on the beach, it's undeveloped. There's no marina. There's no yacht club. There's no hotel. There are no roads, no cars or trucks driving around, no motorcycles. So you've got a, a young kid, and, and even for ourselves, just to know that you're going to this place that's, that's completely unspoiled. So with kids, you put a life jacket on them and hang out with them on the beach and or take them on one of the walks. Uh, there are a number of excursions to choose from at, at any given landing. There would probably be between three and five different excursions all included that you can take advantage of. There might be deep water snorkeling where you go snorkeling off of one of the Zodiacs, um, offshore snorkeling where you just sort of waddle into the water off of the beach. You can just hang out on the beach if you want to and just beach comb and, and, or just lay on a towel. Go on a short ha short hike where uh, they're not going to cover a great deal of distance because they're stopping at literally everything and every couple yards they're stopping along the way and the naturalists are pointing things out. Or there could be a more strenuous hike where the idea isn't to stop at everything every couple yards, but the idea is to get to the other side of the island to see uh, a colony of albatross where the young are just about to fledge and they're, uh, they're at the edge of the cliff sort of willing themselves off of the cliff and learning how to fly. So there might be, you know, as many as five different excursions at, at uh, any given landing site. And Carl, per that last slide, I get this question a lot. What is the minimum age? for expedition. Oh, thanks. Uh, minimum age for expedition is five. It has to do with, with zooming around in Zodiacs and that sort of thing. So um, five-year-olds sometimes will listen to you um, and they're, they're big enough that we can get a life jacket on them. Um, smaller than that and it starts to get uh, tough to find life jacket sizes. And, and if a, uh, a Zodiac did take a big bounce, you could pretty easily bounce a small kid out of a Zodiac. So even with five-year-olds, I mean, I had one, one hand on the Zodiac and one hand around him. So that if, uh, if he got bounced, I was going to hold him in, but yeah, five is the minimum age for expedition. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, sorry, um, snorkeling is another activity, obviously, in, that I mentioned in uh, the Galapagos. And a lot of people will ask, do I need to bring my own gear? This is the beauty of it. No, you don't have to bring any of your own gear. If you've got a, you know, like a rash shirt or something like that, a rash guard, you might want to bring that. But the mask, the fins, the snorkel, the wetsuit, it's all provided. So you go and get yourself fitted with a, a mask that fits you and fins that fit you, etc. cetera, uh, on day one. You put it in a mesh bag that's got your suite number on it. You hang it up and it's yours to use for the rest of the cruise. Uh, so you don't have to go hunting around in a bin of masks to find one that fits you every time you want to go. And also with what's going on these days, uh, it is yours. No one else is using it. So right. It's and they're disinfected. Yes. Yeah. And, and they're, they're disinfected dis between daily. So. Right. Thank you. Uh, and, 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 be and between voyages. Yeah. Um, so those are the big three. But the other thing I wanted to talk about, because when we talk about expedition, we very often think about, uh, you know, all of the excursions are by Zodiac and we're always going to a remote location on a beach somewhere where there, where, where there are no humans. Um, so, you know, Antarctica to go see penguins or the Galapagos to land on a beach to go see, uh, you know, the blue footed boobies or the sea lions or something like that. But 
it's also a way, or we can use these small expedition ships to visit traditional destinations, but in a non-traditional way. So I had the, the great good fortune to go to Japan with my family in May of last year. Now, I had been to Japan a couple of times uh, in, in uh, previous parts of my career, and I'd done sort of the iconic Japanese tourist thing. So I'd been to Tokyo and Kyoto and Hiroshima, and I'd taken a high-speed train, and I stayed in a ryokan and did all of those things. But being a guy who who likes to be out in nature and, and likes that adventurous aspect of traveling, I had never seen rural Japan. And I really wanted to. So when this opportunity came along, my wife and son and I went to Osaka and we spent four days there. We did take a high-speed train. We went up to Kyoto. We saw a fair bit of the Japanese culture and, and some of that iconic uh, Japanese stuff that you would want to experience as a tourist. But then we got on board a 144 guest cruise ship and we went into little ports and, and uh, you know, small by Japanese standards, but small, I would say, for a port that you're taking a cruise ship into. Uh, towns of 250,000, 400,000 that were primarily a fishing village. They had a bit of a fishing fleet, but they had never had a cruise ship. So not only was it a maiden voyage for the ship where the local, uh, the mayor, you know, would give us the plaque of the town with the coat of arms on it to, to hang up in the ship because it was the first time the ship had been, but it was the first time a cruise ship had ever been to some of these ports. So in addition to the mayor, there was a jazz band and all the kids, uh, it, it, the senior kids in the high school who spoke English best, they came down to greet us. And then we had the opportunity to get out from some of these places in a very short drive, you know, 15, 20 minutes, and we're out into the countryside and seeing forests and, and fields and rice paddies and things like that and having this, this very, very sort of rural Japanese experience. In general, uh, you know, just coming back to what I was saying about expedition, it's very much, again, about getting you to a destination that would be difficult, if not impossible, to do on your own and using this very, very comfortable, luxurious platform that has everything included, uh, including butler service, to get you to the just to the edge of that spot. And then using the Zodiacs and the kayaks and, and using our expedition team members and their expertise to get you off of the ship and to go explore. For example, this is the Darien Gap in uh, Central America. This is sea kayaking in the Arctic, a remote beach somewhere in Iceland. Even if you put together your own trip and you rented a car and you had a driver and you went around the ring road of Iceland, you wouldn't be able to get to this spot. So, you you, you know, it has to be done from a cruise ship. So we're taking this luxury, this floating luxury hotel and circumnavigating Iceland and visiting spots of Iceland that are very, very difficult, if not impossible to get to on your own. And then going into small fishing villages uh, again, because it's a very small ship and cruise ships, big, big cruise ships can't get in there. Again, ours are limited in, in guest capacity from 100 to 600. And the ones that are doing expedition are uh, ranging guest capacity from 100 to 240. So really, really small ships when you consider that some of them uh, floating around out there are, are in excess of 6,000 passengers. Uh, this is across the Bering Sea from Alaska over in Russia, the, what we refer to as the Russian Far East. So the Kamchatka Peninsula or Chukotka. Um, something that a lot of these places have in common is uh, no cell signal. You're, uh, you're not going to be able to phone home or text from here until you're back to the ship and you can take advantage of the complimentary Wi-Fi. Um, no t-shirt shop. You couldn't buy a t-shirt here if you wanted to because we're so far out in the middle of nowhere. This is in the Galapagos. Uh, on a hike in Madagascar or on a remote beach somewhere in the, the Seychelles or the Maldives. Not another soul around. And it's rare that we'll even find another ship nearby. Now, we do go and visit villages and and. Uh, you know, we'll get off at little places and, and very often taking the Zodiacs because uh, sometimes some of these places are, are small enough that we can't even come alongside and tie up at a pier. So we'll use the Zodiacs to get ashore and go exploring that way and go visit a local village and meet with some of the local folks and test some of their, try some of their food and, and learn about their lifestyle and their culture and, and that sort of thing. Uh, this is uh, the, the northwest coast of Australia, an area called the Kimberley Coast. And this is called Montgomery Reef. And this is a phenomenon that occurs at low tide. And it creates a tidal river. 
So you can see at the top, the upper left-hand corner, way off in the distance, you can see the ship there. And again, we've gotten off the ship and we're using the Zodiacs to go and explore uh, this tidal river that you only see when the tide goes out. And then these little waterfalls cascading into it. They're not true waterfalls, obviously, but this is all seawater um, coming into this tidal river. So a really amazing phenomenon that you just would not be able to see if you couldn't get close enough to this place. So that's very much what expedition is about. And, you know, one of the things that you can see here is that I'm showing you all of these images about the destinations. I could show you images of the butlers and them bringing you a tray of drinks and showing off some of the food and all that sort of thing. But frankly, that should be your minimum expectation. If we call ourselves a luxury small ship cruise line, that should be your minimum expectation, that our service is going to be impeccable, but the food is phenomenal, that the wines are incredible. That's the minimum expectation that you should have. What I'm trying to show off or trying to get across is that we use that platform then to get you to these incredible parts of the world. Get off of the ship, get some dirt under your fingernails, get your boots on the ground and really go and explore these places. Uh, lastly, I just wanted to review a, a brand new uh, exciting uh, announcement. And this is that we're going to, starting in December of next year, we're going to be visiting Antarctica in a different way. Typically, you would sail from the southern tip of South America from a small Argentinian city called Ushuaia. You sail for 36 hours to get across the Drake Passage and to get to uh, the South Shetland Islands and, and ultimately to the Antarctic Peninsula. Starting in December of 2021, we're going to reduce that 36-hour crossing to two hours for some of our voyages. So you will be able to fly across the Drake Passage if you want to. So for those who are very short on time, you can't commit to a two-week trip to Antarctica, but you still really want to go to Antarctica. Or for those who have uh, heard that the Drake Passage can be uncomfortable sometimes and you don't want to risk it because you're prone to seasickness, then you might want to consider doing something like this. Because again, that 36-hour crossing in each direction is reduced to two hours. So we're flying from Punta Arenas across the Drake. That little red pin there uh, is showing you King George Island. And here's a, a blow up of King George. You can see where there's a, a Chilean air base uh, that have a, a, an airstrip there, a gravel strip, and that's where we'll land. And then from there, it's a short walk down to the beach where the Zodiacs are waiting for us to take us uh, aboard the ship, take us over to the ship. This is the aircraft that we'll use. There are a couple, we, the, the company that we work with has four of these. It's a British Aerospace 146, a BAE 146. A couple of, inter, a couple of special things you can see about this. Obviously, it's a high wing aircraft. You're not used to seeing that and four jets for what is ostensibly a 90 or 95 passenger uh, aircraft. We're only gonna put 70 people in it in a business class configuration. And that's a lot of jets to carry a 95 passenger um, aircraft. The reason is it's a short takeoff and landing. Um, it was designed as a, as a stall aircraft and it's uh, very, very effective for that under these conditions and, and flying over to this strip in Antarctica. So it's the perfect uh, tool to use for this. And then, as I said, we get over there. It's a short walk down to the beach, into the Zodiacs, and then over to the ship, the Silver Explorer. She was uh, completely refurbed in the fall of 2019. So she's uh, gorgeous inside and out. Here's the dining room. And then the suites. Uh, the ship all of our ships, the entire fleet, you know, uh, in the old days or, or a while back, ships were built and they had sort of dark wood and dark colors. And, and uh, it was very, it had a more shippy feel, you know, and now things are much more contemporary and much lighter and brighter and, and, and neutral tones and things like that. It just looks bigger and, and more open and more spacious. Um, so that's how this ship looks and, and she looks brand new and she's absolutely gorgeous. And also, on that same note, like you mentioned, all of our ships have the same aesthetic and style and feel, but there's also no inside cabins. Um, it's all ocean view with coming with our new ships in the fleet will be just over 90% with verandas as well. Um, the ones that don't have verandas are typically adjoining rooms to larger suites to add that second or whatever may be bedroom on. So just to give you that visual as well, there are no inside cabins. It's all open, airy. The average uh, entry level size is about 370 square feet on classic and expedition is, uh, what is it, 330 maybe? 
Still quite yeah, a lot of stuff. yeah, something like yeah. that. So yeah. Compared to most cruise ship cabins, these suites are quite large and convertible. Yep, and and again, just a reminder: every suite category, uh, whether on classic or on expedition, comes with butler service. Now, you may be kind of rolling your eyes, as I first did. And thought butler service. And one of the first people I asked was Hunter when I started with Silver Sea. And I said, so really, like, what's what's the butler all about? And as soon as you experience it, everyone has their butler story. So um, a couple of weeks before heading to the Galapagos, I could sense that my wife was not as enthusiastic as I thought she might be. And I said, are you not looking forward to this trip? And she said, absolutely, I am. I'm, I'm, to be honest, I'm a little nervous about the whole butler thing. I don't know what to expect. And I, can, I said, well, all I can tell you is what my colleagues have told me, which is you'll, you'll come to appreciate your butler very, very quickly, like within a day or two. So we traveled there with a five-year-old. And the first opportunity we had to get in the water, we did. And it was in the morning of the second day. And we came back to the ship, having been out on the beach and whatever took all our wet gear, threw it into the shower and went to lunch. Because if you've had small kids, you know that you have a one hour window in which to feed them lunch. And if you miss that window, you've lost the rest of your day. So we uh -huh. rushed to lunch to make sure that uh, we got them fed within our window. And then we went, we attended a lecture, I think at one o'clock. And then the expedition leader said, well, it's, it's two at two 30, we're going to head back out. So Go and get your backpacks and get ready. We're heading back out. There's another snorkeling opportunity and a swimming opportunity. And we wanted to take advantage of that. So we headed back to our suite, expecting that we were now going to try and get wet gear onto a five-year-old and put our own wet gear on, only to arrive in the suite and find out that the butler had grabbed all the wet gear, spun it dry, and then dried it, uh, folded it, and it was sitting folded, waiting on the bed for us to grab and, and take off and uh, to take with us off on our next excursion. They learn what your drink preference is. Um, you know, when you come back from an excursion at six o'clock, if the first thing you ask for is a gin and tonic and a beer, it only takes two or three days before they figure that out and you don't even have to ask for it the next time. The folks bringing you back to the ship on the Zodiac will radio the food and beverage team who in turn relay the message to the butler and you open your suite and your gin and tonic and your beer are waiting for you. So you don't even have to ask. That's the kind of thing that the, the butlers are doing. So I, I hadn't brought that up before, so I thought I'd bring it up now. Um, just quickly back oh, to the explore. Sorry, Hunter, go ahead. Real quick. And then they'll do as much as you'd like or as little as you want. You can be completely honest with them. They are just alert your liaison to the rest of the ship to what you may not know that you want. They know that you want it. Um, but if you don't want to use them or, or bother them or whatever it may be, just let them know and they'll be as distant as they need to be for you. So don't yep. overthink it too much. It's a great thing. Yeah. Um, just quickly back to the uh, Silver Explorer, a couple of, of enhancements coming to the ship uh, starting in that uh, 2021 Antarctic season. We're getting more kayaks, uh, sorry, we're getting kayaks on the ship. She currently does not have kayaks, but she will be getting them. We're getting more Zodiacs and more expedition team members. Uh, 14 kayak, 14 Zodiacs and 14 expedition team members. And what that means on a ship with 144 guests is that we'll be able to get everybody off of the ship and into a Zodiac at the same time. We can disembark the entire ship at the same time. Uh, again, with one group, looking at the example of Antarctica, one group on shore and one group Zodiac cruising, but everybody off the ship at the same time, which is great. And also the ratio of, of group and group sizes. Yeah. The more expedition leaders that we have, the smaller the groups can be. You know, you don't want a class of 20. You'd rather have a class of 10 there or a group of 10. It makes Absolutely. it that much more easy. Yeah. So, um, perfect. So we're at the, uh, close to the end here, not quite at the end. Um, Carl, how are we doing on time? We, we doing good? I think we're good. Uh, do you want to check okay. and see if we've got any questions? We do. Let's, let's jump right in here. So first one, do I need any special clothing? So I think you and I touched on that a little bit. Uh, first of all, the parkas, again, you see them in this image here. In, in the colder destinations, we provide the parka, so you don't need to go and get one. If, if you live in a warmer climate, it's not something that you need to go and, and buy for this one-off. Um, and, and if you don't live in a warmer climate, you live in a place where you're used to wearing, uh, where you have winter and, and you've got a big winter coat, it's not something you need to pack and worry about uh, taking up some of your precious luggage space and, and your luggage weight allowance. Um, it's waiting for you when you get to the ship and it's yours to keep. If you choose to keep it, great. 
if you don't, that's fine too. There are a lot of people walking around in, in some of the communities that we visit with uh, silver sea parkas. They are a really, really good piece of gear. It's a three in one. So the, the uh, outer shell is the windproof waterproof part of it. And then you can zip in uh, an insulated piece into that. So you can wear the insulated piece on its own when it's chillier, but it's not necessarily raining. You can wear the shell on its own when it's raining, but not that cold, or you can put the two pieces together. And it's a very, very nice, warm, waterproof piece. Um, and then, Hunter, you mentioned before that we will provide a very extensive packing list. Regardless of the destination, every packing list is different based on the destination that we're going to. And we work with a company called Ship to Shore, who help us with some of the gear as well. So if it's gear that you don't have and it's gear that you don't think you'll use again, Ship to Shore, uh, looking at that packing list, Ship to Shore will will uh, put together a package of three or four items. You can you can say, I just need this one item, and you can rent that item from Ship, ship to Shore, or you can rent a package of gear of three or four or five pieces that you might need. And again, Ship to Shore will put it together for you and send it down to the embarkation point. It'll be uh, waiting for you on the ship as well. So uh, yeah, we wanna make sure that everybody's uh, warm and comfortable and dry and, and as well outfitted as possible. So that the packing list, the gear we provide and the company that we work with um, so that you can rent the gear that you need. Perfect, yep, that's exactly right. And to his point, it'll lead into the next question as well. That that park will, that we provide is fantastic. Um, I've used it now the last two seasons while skiing. Um, and those of you that ski or get out in that type of weather know you need the right gear. Um, and this past season I was skiing and it was about two degrees Fahrenheit. So that lets you know that this jacket is, is up to that. So the next question that I see here is what is the weather like specifically in the polar regions? Now, I'm assuming that they're wondering if it's in the negatives, if it's negative 50, like we see on the TV <laughs> and on the documentary. So touch on what we're looking at as far as the weather there. Yeah, sure. Fair question. So first of all, the, the Antarctic season runs from November to early March. Um, you may have some operators that will start in late October and go into uh, well into March, sometimes into April. But for the most part, it's about a four, four and a half month season, I would say. All of November, December, January and February. And sometimes you drift into March. Um, so it's the Austral summer. It's their summer. It's, it's winter in the northern hemisphere. It's, it's summer down there. But it is Antarctica. You're in very, very southern latitudes. But it's it's not uncommon for it to be just a few degrees above or just a few degrees below zero. That's That tends to be the range that we operate in because it is their summer. One of the things that uh, we take advantage of uh, because it's the summer is, or I shouldn't say we take advantage of, but one of the things that, that occurs is we're getting 20 to 24 hours of daylight. So you may not think that it's it's going to warm things up and, and bring it up into the 50s and the 60s, but it can bring it up you know, into the high 30s, possibly even 40, which doesn't sound like much. But if you consider all the gear we're talking about in the parka that, that Hunter and I were describing uh, and that packing list and, you know, a base layer and then a mid layer and, and then your parka on top of it, there's no reason anybody would, would feel cold. Uh, on, a, on a voyage like this. If the weather is truly foul one day and, you know, it's snowing sideways with a, a howling wind, we're not going to take anybody out in conditions like that anyway. It's dangerous and, and we're just not going to do that. Um, if, the, if the waves or the ice conditions are such that we can't get the Zodiacs in the water, we might just maneuver the ship to another area where it's not being affected by wind, where it's in the lee of the wind and uh, a bay has not become um, wind blown full of ice and we can get in with the zodiacs so you know there are ways that we can mitigate I, I don't want to say we can mitigate the weather of course we can't change it but we can work around it sometimes um that's a, a great point flexibility is key with expedition yeah absolutely you can't so then, control nature here so we have the we have a great ability to to be able to just navigate and be flexible here and pivot. yeah it's, it's, um, and, and in the Arctic, the season there runs from late May, so usually all of June, all of July, all of August, uh, and then well into September. 
Um, in September, by the time September rolls around, we're usually in, in Western Greenland. Um, you're starting to get more hours of darkness at night. Um, similar to Antarctica, when we start the season in the Arctic, when in, in May and June and, and probably into the first part of July, again, 20, 22, 24 hours of daylight a day. Um, and that all of that solar radiation is definitely uh, heating up the area around you. So the temperatures in the Arctic would tend to be warmer than they would be in Antarctica. So probably into the 40s and occasionally into the 50s um, on, a, on a really bright, warm, sunny day. If you're hiking around, it's not uncommon to see people having unzipped their red parka and have it tied around their waist. Uh, because it's it's pretty warm, especially when you're moving around. You're under that intense polar sunshine all the time as well. Uh, but again, there's no reason for anybody to be cold if they're if they're looking at the packing list and if they're using the parka um, that we've provided. Great, perfect. Um, so we are kind of running short on time here. We want to make sure that you guys can get back to your days and everything going on. So if you have any more questions, please reach out to your cruise web. Um, travel advisor and you know we're always in touch with them so happy to help it at any time um, but uh, thank you so much for joining us Carl thanks for joining me anytime and, uh, Cruise Web, everybody over there thanks for having us we really appreciate the partnership and um, look forward to talking to you all soon take care everyone thanks bye-bye